Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer and we'll get into our class. Father, we thank you so much for this time. Once again, Lord, that you have given us to just come together and study and learn. And we pray, God, that even as we learn, uh, that our hearts will be open to your leading, to your guidance, Lord, that Holy Spirit, you will continue to minister to our hearts, oh God, to learn. And Lord, we even as we learn, God, empower us by your Spirit of God. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so last class we were talking about uh, spiritual aspects. That was yesterday, uh, chapter 17. We looked at how, um, <coughs> sorry, when it comes to church planting, uh, uh, we know that the battle for souls is a spiritual battle. Right? So you know, we can do all our outreaches, we can do all our programs, all our events, which is all important. Uh, but the real battle for souls is a spiritual battle, right? Uh, and, and so we learned about how the devil, you know, he binds people's minds, he holds them in bondage, he hinders the work of the gospel, and he also brings in uh, things into the church by weakening the church. He infiltrates into the church, right? Uh, but we also closed yesterday talking about the church's responsibility. Now, uh, the reason we learned about okay what the enemy is doing is because we know his tactics. We are not unaware of it, uh, but we are also focusing not on the enemy, but we're focusing on what God has done for us. And so through the cross, uh, God says, you know, the Lord Jesus says, the church has authority. The church has kingdom power. We have spiritual weapons that God has given us. We, uh, you know, we uh, subdue, we overcome, we can bind, we can uh, use our spiritual weapons that God has given us uh, to, you know, uh, build God's kingdom. So as pioneers, as leaders, as pastors of a church, uh, this is something that uh, we must be established in. We must know in our heart that uh, the victory is already won. The Lord Jesus has uh, paid the price. We are victorious. Uh, and, and you know, uh, just interestingly, yesterday, uh, uh, one of our uh, students had come down from Varanasi. And uh, I was getting, uh, got a lot of time to talk to him. And he was sharing about the church in, you know, North India. There are, so he was saying three states. Uh, in India, right? One is um, Uttar Pradesh, uh, the other one is Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh. So these are three states where there's intense persecution that is happening right now, right? And apparently he was saying that pastors have been, uh, you know, locked up for months and years. And uh, even when the, you know, the uh, papers go for the hearing comes into the court, uh, the judges say, no, we don't want to hear this case go to another place and uh, so uh, but it was very disheartening to see that you know pastors and uh, even even women who are leaders of the church have been put into prison and they've been there for six months or a year and more than a year as well uh, but on the flip side he was saying the more the persecution is happening the more the church is growing meaning more you know uh, in in his entire village uh, 500 people just in this from the beginning of january 2023 500 odd people have given their life to christ only in his village so you know he was saying yes the enemy is doing a lot uh, trying to hinder the work or uh, hinder the church uh, but god is still working so i was so encouraged right uh, of course i we do feel you know a pain for those who are going through uh, you know, being in the prison, going through this intense persecution. But we look at the other side. Uh, God is still building the church. God is still doing his work. It's not that God is sitting back and just watching everything. No, he is building the church. And so it was very, very encouraging for me uh, just to hear it. Of course, we can't do uh, open air events and even churches are, are meeting in a very in secluded places in home settings and even in home settings um, 
you know he was sharing that uh, you know they don't meet more than five or six people because they get to know it's a prayer then they would come in and uh, so all of this is there right but jesus says i will build my church the gates of hell shall not prevail against it so god has given us weapons he has given us authority so let's get into chapter 18 we're talking about praying and exercising authority for spiritual transformation right now as a church uh, when, when you look at a church uh, uh, i'm talking about a local church right when you plant a local church it is very important to engage in three spiritual aspects right? uh, of course there are many other but three very important is prayer praise and worship ministry of the word right uh, these are the most important aspects in a church plant right you know, when, when you have a church you, we got to ensure that these three prayer ministry of the word praise and worship now it's not like there's an order all three of them are important um and these are basically the foundations of the church now uh, the other things of having a stage and the lights and all of that that is additional right now I'm not saying that's not important that is important that's needed uh but the foundation of the church is not uh you know the the lightings or the stage no the foundation is these three ministry of the word praise and worship and prayer right and and so when we engage um in prayer when we engage uh in praise and worship what are we doing we are exercising spiritual authority over those who are lost uh, and we cannot control or dictate people's choices right nor can we manipulate people we cannot say hey uh, why don't you come to this place on Sunday? And uh, it's not a church service, but we're just maybe 50 of us meeting together. Now, that's called manipulation. Right? We, we don't do that, right? Each person has to make their own decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us as pastors, as leaders, we cannot make a decision for another person. Now, they may come, they may ask questions, they may have a hundred questions, right? Uh, they may want to know. It, that's wonderful. But the decision finally has to be made by the person. We cannot force them to do it. We cannot say, hey, kneel down and pray and let Jesus come into your heart. Uh, even if he does it, or if he does it by force, that is not real change, right? So, through prayer and the exercise of spiritual authority, we make it easier for people to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, for example, uh, look at this. Um, how many of you, you know, uh, before becoming believers, we were just living our life, you know, just doing everything in the world, living sinful lives. How many of you can testify that, hey, I am here because of the prayers of others, right? I'm sure many of us can say that. In my personal life, uh, I, I didn't want God. God was the last thing on my list. Um, it was not something that I was looking forward to. Uh, it was not that you know I wanted to learn. I wanted to know about Jesus. I was fine. Everything is going fine. Uh, but it was the prayers of others. It was definitely the prayers of others. And God's grace comes in, right? Uh, especially when you are hard hearted and, you know, you just know that, you know, growing up, I was very hard hearted, right? So I didn't want anybody to tell me anything. Right? Uh, forget about the Bible. That was the last thing that they would tell me, but just telling me anything. I didn't want anyone to speak to me. Um, uh, but it was the prayers of people, prayers of family members, prayers of relatives and prayer groups meeting together, praying. Now, I, I didn't know that. Right? But those prayers, what they do is they break those hard heart. You know, uh, we were talking about how the devil 
blinds us, right? He blinds us. He hardens our heart to the gospel. So when we pray, that hard heart softly, you know, slowly begins to break, right? There is territory gained. Why? Because we are, we are slowly but steadily taking ground. Right, we're, we're making sure that the enemy, there's these certain areas are being broken off, uh, you know, stage by stage. Okay, uh, these spirits that are causing anger or uh, spirits that are causing this blindness, you know, people are praying for it. We don't know it. We don't know what's happening. But all of a sudden, now, six months down the line or one year down the line, you're, you know, you just come across some somebody telling you about Jesus, and you're willing to listen. Now, that's basically what happened to me, right? I remember this pastor coming home and saying, why don't you come play guitar in church? I said, okay, since it's guitar, I'll come. Right? Uh, I, I didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Uh, I said, okay, guitar, I'll come. Uh, but just one year before that, there was nobody allowed inside my house. No pastors are allowed. I would put a, you know, protection there I said no past no preachers allowed inside my house right. uh, but what happened it's the prayers of others right people pray people intercede and God begins to work and so while interceding for the lost we engage in two aspects pray that the Lord uh, pray to the Lord for his work to be done towards that person or towards the lost right now we're talking about both people and communities cities and nations right so pray to the lord that his work and his will and his plans and purposes will prevail uh, for the lost right uh, if you look at it you know we studied this about fulfilling god's purpose pro purposes for our lives god has a blueprint god has a purpose for every person for every city, every town, every city, every nation, there is a purpose, right? So we pray, God, let your purposes prevail in this person's life. Let your purposes prevail in the city, in the nation, in the communities. Let your plans, let your purpose prevail. So what are we doing? We are beginning to gain territory. Now, here's the thing that we must remember. Right. Even as you enter, you know that this is a spiritual battle. You know that you're entering uh, a territory where there are going to be demonic forces. Right now, never be afraid of it. Right. Don't be afraid. Hey, wh where am I going? Am I, uh, you know, am I going to bring trouble over my family, or is something? Go no, don't be afraid of it. Right. You you go in. You are praying to the Lord to do it. We are not doing it, right? But the Lord is going to do it. So don't be afraid, right? Doesn't matter what kind of uh, territory you're getting into, right? Uh, you, you pray, pray with authority, pray with boldness. Now I want to put a little disclaimer here. Now, if you know that there are certain areas, right? Uh, there's witchcraft, there is uh, occult and witchcraft practices, and you know that there, the, these areas are there in the city. Now, if you feel that you're not ready to pray for that, right, it's all right. right? Don't pray for it. Right? Uh, you, you can just take a step back. Right? Pray for other things. You can pray for youth. There are many other things we can pray for, for the youth, for teens, for workplaces the seven spheres of influence you can right now now if you're not if you feel that you're not spiritually there yet right uh or there's some kind of fear uh, inside you it is natural it's all right uh, you, you can wait you can pray for other things right and but pray right there, there are many things that we can pray for right in the city so you can do that. And two is spiritual warfare. Now, establishing God's presence through worship and through exercising our spiritual authority to destroy what Satan is doing um, that hinders people from coming to the gospel. 
right? So spiritual warfare, right? Uh, and Paul writes in the Corinthians. Uh, let me just try to pull up that verse here. Oh. Yeah, uh, Second Corinthians chapter ten. <clears throat> Sorry, verse four. He says, "The weapons we fight are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ." Right. So the beginning passage, 10 verse 4, the weapons of our warfare, the weapons that we fight, are not the weapons of the world. In another place, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. They bring down strong coals. Right? So remember that when we are fighting this spiritual warfare, uh, the battles, the, 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 the weapons that we have, are not carnal. Remember uh, James, he writes and he says, uh, Elijah prayed, and then he gives that whole example, and then he ends it by saying, the prayers of a righteous man is effective. He doesn't say a prayer of a pastor, a prayer of a pioneer, a prayer of an apostle is effective. He says the prayers of a righteous man. Right? So engaging, get your church community engaged together, right? Uh, have times of prayer. Well, some of the things that we do as a church, and you, if you'd like, you can replicate it. You can come up with your own plans. And uh, some of the things that we do is we had, we have twenty-one days of fasting and worship and fasting and prayer. This is in the first, or, or maybe sometimes it's on the uh, in February first week. So the whole of February, because in January we have a conference and. So February first week, right? Twenty-one days fasting and prayer every day, as a church, come together, pray for people, pray for the church, pray for the city, pray for the nation, everything. Right? Twenty-one days, and then after every semester, uh, so that's every six months, we have five days of fasting and prayer. Again, worship, prayer, prayer points. And we all pray together, right? So what are we doing? We are, we are establishing God's presence. We are through worship. We are, we are, we are trying to uh, tap into places where the enemy is working and destroying the work of the devil. Right. Uh, and if we look back, I remember the, uh, you know, initially I used to think, you know, why are we doing these prayers? Right? Twenty-one days of prayer. I'm talking about 2010, and we would be. Maybe about ten people, and uh, we, we, you know, twenty-one days of prayer and five days of prayer. So I used to always think to myself, "Why are we doing this? Nobody's coming." But then I realized that hey, it's not about that. It's about what is happening in the spiritual realm. Even if we have 10, 15 people, there was there was a there, there is something that is happening in the spiritual realms right and so the way that we can gain ground the way that we can exercise uh, transformation is through spiritual warfare and then comes the other aspects right evangelism uh, reaching out events programs all of that comes next spiritual warfare is number one now if we don't pray, we haven't spent time in prayer. We haven't uh, done the, you know, the basic, the foundation. And of course, God is faithful; He will still work. But what will happen is the, you know, if we are trying to reach out, or trying to, uh, you know, tap into a new uh, place in a city, a new area in the city, what will happen is uh, it's very unlikely that we will not see victory. Because we haven't spent time in prayer, right? uh, most likely we'll be like, uh, you know, we may get tired, we may get weary, we may give up very soon, 
so it's very important to first have these two in order, right? Prayer, spiritual warfare. Right? So how do we pray for the lost? Uh, we learned some of this, um, and I'm sure that uh, you know, in lifestyle evangelism, we learn so much. But let's look at some of the, these points. How do we pray for the lost? Pray and ask God for the city as an inheritance and a possession. Psalms 2.8 talks about it, right? Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. Pray and invite the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, 7 through 11. Uh, it's a wonderful passage, John 16, 7 through 11. Now, can we just read that? John 16, 7 through 11. I can also read, uh, or you can just start with the 8. So, John 16. Yes, go ahead. Anyone can read, please. 7 through 11, you can read. John Nevertheless, I tell 16. you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Mm. Okay. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Yes. Yeah, thank you, John. So we see here that when we, when we pray, and I'm sure we all know about all of this, but uh, it's, it's good to remind ourselves, when we pray and invite the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives, it brings about sin, righteousness, and judgment. We cannot do the convicting. We cannot, right? Uh, because even if we can do some convicting, that's only going to be, uh, you know, it could be a temporary convicting, right? It's like, uh, like what parents do to children. Uh, but when the Holy Spirit comes, He brings a holy conviction, and there's a change in a person's life. A person can be a hardcore criminal for 20 years and the Holy Spirit can make him the most softest person uh, you know, after he becomes a believer. So we must pray for the Holy Spirit to work, to move, to touch people's lives. Right? Ask God to draw them to him. To, the, to him, right? So the Bible teaches us, John 6, 44, um, John 12, 32, and many other passages. He says, if you draw to me, I will draw, uh, I will draw my people. I will draw them to me. Oh. And so when we pray, God, this is what you said. You will draw your people. Uh, you will draw your children to yourself. Do it. Right. Then we pray that God will move them, uh, bring them to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth, uh, that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the evil one. Right. So repentance uh, is, again, it comes through conviction. Uh, when we repent of our sins, God convicts us, we repent of our sins, and we begin to walk in the knowledge of the truth of God's work. God's word, God's promises, and we will come to their senses to know that what they're doing is a trap by the evil one. Right? Uh, you know, I, I just thought I'll share this. A couple of months back, or maybe a month back, a very close, a good friend of mine. Right? Uh, we grew up together, but he was two years. He's two years younger to me, and uh, he was a pastor's son. Right, and. Uh, you know, I would keep telling him, he knows everything about the Bible, everything, right? Growing up, we grew up uh, in, in, in church, right? He knew those Bible verses, knew everything. But, you know, as he became a teen, he he got into drugs and all these other things. And, uh, you know, uh, many people were praying for him. But eventually what happened was he he would always sense that he's in a trap. And he would tell me, you know, I feel that I'm in a prison cell. But I keep telling him, see, you know everything. You know the word of God. You know uh, the Holy Spirit is there. It is your responsibility. There's nothing more I can do. 
but you know if i tell you scriptures you know it you know the gospel you know what jesus did um but the enemy i i you know whenever i speak to him i think what well, the enemy has put a trap around this person so tell him you're in a trap you're in a cell because you have allowed the devil to put you into the cell and locked it and you're saying devil please help me out you don't have to ask the devil to let you out you ask god to let you out so i used to keep ministering to him and uh, you know last month uh, uh, all of a sudden he died of a heart attack right? and it was very very painful uh, just thinking about it talking about it very painful uh, but this is what the devil does he puts people into traps and he puts people into these traps that are not only uh, physical but also in the mind he traps people he traps people in thinking that you know uh, they have in prison cells and so when we pray we got to pray that god they will know the knowledge of the truth of god's word right uh, unfortunately there are people who know the word of god but they don't know the truth of god's word right and so we must pray that lord you will speak to them ask god to grant them a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that their spiritual eyes will open that be they be enlightened they will see the lord they will see the beauty of his word they will see and know the purposes of god now all of these things we can pray for for people I, uh, my heart goes out when i see young people my college students my heart really goes out because i see them uh, there's so much that the world has to offer so much you know when we were growing up there was no phones there was no social media i thank god for that but i thank god for social media now as well but uh you know we spend our time you know cycling outside or doing something outside but when i look at this generation and look at what's happening uh, and it's so easy to fall into traps and one of our church members came up to me and said pastor i i i feel discouraged today i said what happened and she said uh, you know she has a genuine heart uh, she said nobody has commented or viewed on what i have posted on instagram it's very easy to say hey come on grow up but i realized that hey it's a it's a trap you know the enemy is using these subtle small things and she's saying i couldn't i could not i could not read the word i could not pray i could not do anything for more than a week subtle traps but we got to ask God to open spiritual eyes, that people will be enlightened, that being in God's presence will, will not be a burdensome thing. People see the beauty of his word, know the purpose, know the calling, know the greatness of his power. You know, Ephesians 1, Paul writes so beautifully, he says, he says, what is our identity, right? He's talking about, hey, we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so we can pray, God, open up people's hearts, open up their eyes, enlighten them. Let them go back to the word. Let the word of God minister to them. Let them know that God has called them. Let them know the greatness of your power. And God begins to work. I pray that God will send forth laborers uh, who will share Jesus and uh, and influence them towards uh, towards just believing in Jesus. So we know the worst. The laborers, uh, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. So we need more laborers. Pray that God will send forth laborers. And finally, pray for God's power to be demonstrated signs wonders and miracles that the supernatural there be supernatural interventions there'll be uh, visitations of god god will uh, you know there'll be outpourings in places that people will see experience the power of god you now yesterday as i mentioned i was speaking to this young man and he's from uh, varanasi and he was talking to me about some of the miracles that are happening in varanasi 
right? So I said, what is happening? I asked him, what is happening in the church in Varanasi? Apart from the persecutions and people coming to Christ, how are people coming to Christ? People who have cancers, right? There are some of them who are on the deathbed. Lame people are walking. Blind people are seeing. Right? And the way he's saying this, he was so, you know, it was as if it's a common thing, right? So he's sharing a testimony about how an, uh, a, a lady in, uh, you know, was was blind. So she kept coming to church. One day she, one of the Sundays, she received healing. She went and sat. She received healing. She went. She sat back. She said, "Thank you, Jesus." And it's a common thing. Right now, what's, what do we do sometimes if somebody receives healing who's blind? We put it on Instagram, Facebook, everywhere else, and make a big deal out of it. There was no big deal. You know, they were they pray for the supernatural, the supernatural happens. Right? And that's what we must do. Just like in the book of Acts, we pray, God, start small, but do it. Right? So as we pray for this, God begins to, you know, just work and begins to uh you know as a pioneer as a church he begins to really strengthen the church right you know, there's the sense of unity oneness all of this happens within the church even though we may be praying for people outside we're praying for the lost you you, you sense this you know the, the, the strength of the lord upon the church upon the believers as well right uh then Preparing for spiritual warfare. Right? Important truths to remember when we are preparing for spiritual warfare. Right? Uh, and we know all of this. Satan has been defeated. He has been crushed. He has been expelled. He's been condemned. He's disarmed. Right? Colossians 2.14. I love that verse. I, I keep declaring it. I say, hey, what does Colossians 2.14 say? Having disarmed every power, every principality and powers of darkness, he made a public spectacle of his victory over the devil. Right? It was such a powerful verse. Said, Having disarmed, he made a public spectacle. Jesus didn't just say, you know, uh, hey, uh, you know, maybe in the physical he just met with a few of them. Uh, after he resurrected from the dead, but in the spiritual, he made a public spectacle. He said to every demon, every and Satan, saying, "Hey, you are defeated. And Satan is powerless." Right. So, right now, you and I are in this place of victory. Right. So, when you're praying for people, when you're praying over cities, over communities, over people. Now, over your congregation, uh, just just be, just stand on this understanding. Hey, I am victorious. Satan has been defeated. And many times the devil will come to bring accusations. Right? We would have prayed maybe for something. We have not received an answer, or we have not received healing. And Satan may come and say, "See, you prayed. You didn't. Get, you haven't received healing." Now, it does not matter. God says, "I'm the healer." If he heals at that moment, wonderful. If he doesn't heal at that moment, God is still the healer. Right? So don't fall into the traps of the devil, right? We have complete mastery and dominion over the enemy. Right? Luke 10 18. Let's read that verse. Like that verse. Luke 10 18. Sorry, 19. Luke 10 19. Go ahead. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. This is Jesus saying, I have given you authority over snakes and scorpions, and nothing by any means will hurt you. So this is this should be established in our heart. That it should be there, like it should be really strong in us, 
know that we are victorious know that we have dominion over the enemy know that we have mastery over the enemy and there is no work that the devil can do that can bring us into his uh, you know under his authority free we are not contending for victory again we are we are here to enforce the victory jesus already has given us right so again wonderful uh we know that we're not fighting for victory but satan and his demons have been crushed destroyed we operate boldly in a sense of authority right enforce christ's triumph right uh, you know as a church you may be 10 people in a church or just a small group and force christ triumph and force christ victory but i remember when uh when we were in uh mangalore we were about seven eight people seven or eight of us and I would, uh, every day every sunday i would say hey i would make them repeat this there's only eight of us uh, so our services used to go on for two and a half hours because we were just eight of us so we would say we would declare this is who i am this is what god did right and we would declare and declare and declare. we would just keep saying it right this is what the victory that we, we have authority we are 10 people right now but in the spiritual realms we are uh, a thousand people right you would declare it and we would go out in boldness right uh because there's this sense of authority a sense of boldness right we would enforce christ's time enforce his victory over everything that we do over every door that he opens we wouldn't go in like in a way of you know uh bowing our heads or you know ashamed but no wherever we got opportunities wherever we went we went victorious we went with our head held high and that will continue to happen All right so even you as a church we talked about this uh, you know seven spheres of influence and even as your church grows your ministry grows enter those seven spheres with boldness with victory knowing that you have dominion over whatever demon that is working in that place whatever spiritual authority that's working you have authority remember we talked about this light well you are the light so when you go into places of darkness light is greater than darkness right remember that we are, we are protected as we keep all entry points closed satan and his demons cannot harm us passage that we always can declare psalms 91 right psalms 91 is a beautiful psalm a thousand may fall at our side ten thousands at our right hand but nothing by any means shall hurt us we're protected right now it's interesting to see here as we keep all entry points closed remember the devil is like a roaring lion trying to devour trying to deceive he's working he's looking for open doors and so as believers, I'm not saying we don't make mistakes. We make mistakes in ministry, in church. We will make mistakes. Uh, but we, we got to go back to God and say, God, this is something I did wrong. Forgive me. Help me to not to do this again. Help me to change. Give me your strength. Let me get back on track. Close all entry points. Remember, Paul again says in one of the verses, he says, don't give the enemy, uh, I don't know if it was Paul or Peter, but I think it was Peter, don't give the enemy a foothold lest he takes the entire place. Right? You close every door. Five, words are important in the spiritual realm. Our authority is exercised primarily by the words that we speak. The words that we speak are important in the spiritual realm. So even if we are, you know, we are just praying, right? We get up early morning. We're getting ready to go to work. He's saying, "He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty." You're saying Psalms ninety-one. 
I'll save the Lord. He's my refuge and my fortress. What's happening? In the spiritual realm, God is doing his work. Right? God is setting his angels. It's not like if we don't say that it does he doesn't set his angels. It's just that we are exercising the authority that God has given us. The words that we speak is affecting spiritual realms. Right? And God begins to work. So speak words over your city. Whenever I see colleges, wherever it is, whenever I see colleges, I just say a small prayer. I say, God, there may be about 1,000 people in this college. That's their lives. Let them come to know you. I know it's it's a hard, it's a, you know, this, this world, there's so much of temptations, there's so much that is there, Lord, but you touch lives supernaturally we touch them that they will come to know you that you will raise up a fivefold ministry leaders in these colleges who will grow up to be pioneers in ministry maybe a three minute prayer what are we doing you're speaking words you're speaking into the spiritual realm uh, and her authority is exercised through the words that we speak right exercising spiritual doors uh, sorry, exercising spiritual authority to open prison doors. Uh, so we talked about this. One is establish God's presence through praise and worship. Declare the finished work of the cross for salvation of the souls in the city. Right. So uh, again, you on the basis of the cross, we can stand, we can declare, we can speak over cities, we can declare people are released from the power of darkness, and they are and they are. Part of God's kingdom, we declare it now. I know it's a far shot. Sometimes we think, "Hey, I'm praying. Where is the fruit?" Or when? Uh, remember, you're maybe you are the one who's putting the seeds, or maybe you are watering the seeds that have already been sowed, or maybe there'll come a time when somebody else will see the harvest, right? Uh, and and we learned in you know Christian history and missions, and we saw that how people laid the foundation. People put the seeds, right? others watered it, but God made it grow. Right? So think of it that way. Right? The, 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 your labor is not in vain. Right? Uh, identify and pull down strongholds and areas of demonic de you know, domination. Uh, and so we looked at that. Right, Those demonic dominations could be anything, suicide, drug addiction, uh, pornography, prostitution, child trafficking um, uh, murders and uh, all of these spirits that are working identify and pull down those strongholds uh, now some of the strongholds may be very subtle right it could be uh, uh, now especially right you have homosexuality you have gay and the lesbian uh, that is going on and uh, you know even strongholds that are entering churches strongholds that are entering ministry uh, sometimes the devil can use money as a stronghold into people's lives, right? All of these things you, you identify and you, know, you pray over these. Ask God to release his power, his light in these places. And finally, destroy the works of the evil spirits that are working in people, right? So uh, uh, there'll be sometimes places, especially if we go into uh, places like North India, where there is... Uh, intense, intense idol worship and uh, idolatry. Uh, usually, what we see there is manifestations of evil spirits and spirits take control over people, dominate them, um, and, and so we can pray over all of these. And uh, and as we do it, right, we, you know, we must remember that as leaders, remember that you know it's not only about my church. It's not only about okay my ministry when will my church grow right remember uh, you know it's kingdom values kingdom culture okay god i'm doing this and i know you know for example if you're praying for another city you're praying for strong goals and uh, things that the devil is doing there you're praying that god will penetrate and we know that you're praying for another city you know that they're not going to come in be part of your church. They are in a different city, but what are you doing? You're, you are sowing into God's kingdom. 
it is never going to be a waste. So remember, our works, uh, our, you know, our, our church and our ministries, all of that is important. Uh, but it's not the size of the ministry that matters. It is what we are doing, uh, what seeds and the fruit that we are going to bear uh, for God's kingdom. That is what matters, right? So even as we, you know, pioneer and we build in our ministries, or we're planning to start. Let these be the focus, right? Let these pointers uh, be the focus of our ministry, and out of all of this flows uh, the ministry, right? Right. Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining this class. Um, we'll catch up next week. Have a great week ahead. God bless. Bye.